With more than two and a half million lives lost and over 120 million confirmed cases worldwide, the pandemic rages on amid mass vaccination efforts. As wealthy countries snapped up COVID vaccine supplies, at least the 47 poor countries in the world have not had even one jab. Since U.S. President Joe Biden took office on day one, an outbreak containment plan has been his focus. Last Thursday, he signed a $1.9 trillion American rescue plan to, the, to deliver relief and recovery from the pandemic to the Americans. Meanwhile, China has administered nearly 65 million vaccine doses as of Sunday. Meanwhile, the country has been donating and exporting vaccines to countries, particularly developing countries around the world. Meanwhile, also participating in the contribution of COVAX. The pandemic is a key topic in China-U.S. talks in Alaska. What are the chances of cooperation on vaccine distribution and pandemic prevention? I talked to Ian Lipkin, an epidemiologist at Columbia University who's also known as the virus hunter. He visited China early last year to help contain the coronavirus. He did contract the virus last March and recovered later. He has a lot to say and to share. Let's listen in. I remember the dearly one year ago, our conversation. At the time, China was still suffering tremendously from the COVID-19 pandemic. In the streets where we walked, it was totally empty. Well, I, I got COVID in March uh, in New York, not in China, but in New York. And um, I got very sick. Uh, it's, you know, there are many people who never fully recover. Even those people who don't have so much lung damage that they wind up on ventilators and hospitals. There are people who have long lingering fatigue, mental dysfunction, all sorts of other problems that we don't yet fully understand. Now, do you think with vaccines and everything, do we have the luxury to talk about an end game? I don't think that this is the time for us to relax completely. So until the entire world is vaccinated, no one anywhere is really safe. This is one of the reasons why we're making such a strong effort to push for vaccines in the developing world. And there are literally 150 vaccines that I know about, probably 20 that could be used in the developing world. And I'm very eager to see them used in that way. The other problem that we're gonna have is that this virus has the ability to adapt to wild animals and domestic animals so that even if we erase it from humans, it will still be lurking in the animal kingdom and it can come out at any time. So we will need to be vigilant. So relaxation is something that is going to be relative. Will we move back toward a normal life? Yes, we will. I think that what we are going to find is that as more and more people are vaccinated, the risk of becoming infected with certain kinds of activities, concerts, sporting events, going to restaurants, will be less. So we will move toward normal. But I'm not sure that we will ever return to the sort of innocence that we had in 2018. What about the situation inside the United States? 500,000 deaths, a very sad number. Um, with the very proactive uh, measures taken by the Biden administration. How fast can we expect uh, a, shall I say, herd immunity? I think you're accurate in saying that the Biden administration is taking this very seriously. And we have dramatically increased the rate of vaccine production as well as the rate that we are vaccinating people. We hope that by summer, the majority of our population will be vaccinated and that we will achieve the immunity we need to dramatically decrease the number of people who are infected. It's a race because at the same time we're trying to roll out these vaccines, we have new variants that are emerging that may in fact evade these vaccines. So there will almost certainly be a requirement to update these vaccines on, a, on an annual basis. We have been hearing a lot about whether China and the United States should cooperate What's your take? I think that we do need to cooperate. 
We, for example, have been working with uh, Professor Ludahai um, in uh, Sun Yat-sen University. I'm going to begin working very shortly with Zong Nen Chen, also in Guangzhou, in our new respiratory disease hospital. We need, are also working with people in Brazil and Mexico and Indonesia, all over the world, trying to find ways to make the world a safer and healthier place. China um, is now a very wealthy country. I know this is not something that people like to talk about, but you know it's important that some of the people who are wealthy in China develop the same sort of relationship to giving, to philanthropy that we see in the West. And I would like very much to reach out to my friends in China and ask that they support this work, not only in China, but around the world. I remember dearly, you told me about your story with uh, Dr. Zhong Nanshan. Your friendship did it back years ago. You were in China, you carried with you in your bag, the test kit that you want to provide to your friend Zhong Nanshan. And you were with him when Wuhan was experiencing a great challenge of COVID-19 and he was among the top experts the Chinese government tapped into. Um, how would you describe this kind of uh, scientists helping each other? I had very several close friends. So when I first went to China in 2003, it was at the invitation of the Minister of Science and Technology, who's now retired from that position, Minister Xu Guangbao. Uh, who uh, still remains a very close friend, as does his whole family, including his daughter, who is a scientist, Bing. Uh, she's also a wonderful friend of mine. And of course, Chen Zhu, who then was vice president of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, then became minister of health, and is now head of the Red Cross, Red Crescent. Uh, and of course, Gao Fu, George Gao, uh, who's director of the CDC. Zhong Nian Shen is, uh, you know, he's a, a special person because he's a clinician. He sees patients, he understands what's necessary, and he's a, he's a treasure. You know, he's somebody who is in his 80s and is still working very, very hard to improve the health care of people in China around the world. Now, what Nian Shen believes um, is that we need to focus primarily on respiratory diseases. These are the ones that can spread most easily. And I agree with them. That is a wonderful place for us to start our focus. There are so many other threats we need to be concerned about too as well, Tian. So we have threats to food security, viruses that kill fish, antimicrobial resistance, which makes many of the drugs that we use to prevent infection less helpful, less effective. And then of course we have other diseases like HIV, influenza, things that we don't even know about that are continuously emerging. We want to make sure, he and I, all of us, that nothing like SARS-CoV-2, like COVID-19 ever happens again. The best way to do this is to establish a global network where anytime there is a cluster of people who become ill, there's a team that becomes aware of this. They send whatever resources are needed to identify the infectious agent, to figure out how it spreads and to contain it. So it cannot become a threat to a city like Wuhan or Beijing or New York or Rome or any other place in the world. The concern right now that people have about where this virus came from needs to shift away from blame. It's Chinese or Malaysia or US, whatever. It doesn't matter. Viruses don't recognize borders. They are everywhere. Any virus can cause threat to human health as a threat to everyone. It needs to be considered an international problem. So China needs to open up. It needs to invite people to come and work with Chinese scientists. If there is something that emerges in the United States, the US needs to open up so that other scientists can come from all over the world. We need to make sure that the very best minds in the world focus on these problems. 
And we need to start thinking in human terms, not Chinese terms or U.S. terms or French terms. There's a, a trend of anti-science rhetorics going on. But how do you as a scientist face up to those things? Your point about um, misinformation that is spread by social media is a very important one. As you know, with editing and artificial intelligence, you can completely change what someone has said and make it sound as though they're saying something which is completely opposite to whatever it is they mean. And those people who are responsible for these platforms, TikTok, WeChat, Facebook, uh, you know, Twitter, all of these different social media platforms need to find a way to monitor what's being distributed so that they can be certain that it's accurate. This is not going to be easy, but this sort of misinformation spreads like a virus. I see something, I post it, somebody else posts it, 10 other people post it, and before you know it, people think that to get a vaccine means to put a, a robot that's circulating through your body collecting information. This is crazy, you know? Um, people have accused Bill Gates of yeah. creating vaccines that have, uh, you know, things that record information on them. It's not possible, it's not true but it actually dissuades people from taking vaccines. So one of the things that I am focusing a lot of my work on right now is not really perceived by my friends who are scientists as being valuable, but it is. I work with Hollywood, I work with social media. We are putting out various public service announcements that explain to people what they need to do to protect themselves and to protect their communities. After this round of pandemic, will still people be thinking hard about what to do for prevention and control? One of the problems with public health is that if you are successful, nobody knows you're there. So there have been outbreaks that we have stopped in certain parts of the world, um, in Asia, as well as in Africa which you've never even heard about. Why? Because we stopped them when there were only six people infected. We were able to isolate them, give them drugs to prevent further replication of the virus. And so you've never heard of these viruses. We've seen this before um, in New York with West Nile virus. The first indication that we had a new virus in North America was the death of large numbers of birds that was a mosquito-borne virus. Nobody paid any attention to it because it was just birds, but it then spread from birds to animals in the zoo, to people, and before we knew it, we had a new outbreak of encephalitis. So surveillance needs to be focused on the animal kingdom as well as on humans, and anything that occurs in an outbreak must be investigated, must be reported, through the World Health Organization must be declared important. Because what happens is, it happens in a city. The mayor, the other people affiliated with the city try to contain the information because they don't want to interrupt their business or their tourism. But ultimately, you can't control these infectious diseases. So you might as well be upfront and open about it from the beginning, because then you can minimize the damage. Anything that starts anywhere in the world is only a nonstop flight of 14 hours from any place else. So it doesn't make sense to call it the China virus, the Italian virus, the US virus. It is a virus and we need to deal with it. So do you think the WHO uh, research, joint research with the Chinese side will bring us much more results uh, in the near future? Or this is going to be a very extended uh, uh, process? Well, I was not part of that uh, group, so I didn't see all of the information, which I understand will be released soon, but I don't know that that's going to be the solution. For us to find out where this virus originated, we need to do a lot of work. We need to look at blood banks, figure out how long it was circulating before people realized it was there. We do this by looking for antibodies. I've offered 
to help the Chinese government do this, uh, and the offer is still open. And Zongnan Chen wants me to join him in this effort, and I look forward to doing that. We need to see if we can identify an intermediate animal, something between bats and people, where the virus might have replicated and developed the ability to become more dangerous for humans. That's gonna require a big investment and a lot of work. But if you consider the trillions and trillions of dollars in RMB that have been lost, it's a very small investment. As I said from the very beginning, and this is, I think, a great place to end. This is one world that needs to work together. Everybody must be protected. Everybody must be monitored and everybody must contribute to the control of infectious diseases. And I would ask, because you have this podium that is extremely important, if you want to help, there, is a, there are programs now which are focused on trying to improve global surveillance to make sure that we never again have such a pandemic. And if anybody reaches out to me who wants to work on this in China or anywhere else in the world, you can easily get to me through my friend who's interviewing me today or through Zongnan, <laughs> Guangzhou, or Chenju, or Minister Xu, or through Columbia University. I am always available and I am honored to be a friend of China as well as a friend to the remest remainder of the world. We are all global citizens. Thank you. <laughs>